Hi class, and welcome to research methods uh, for your highlights chapter on chapter three, research ethics. So likely you've already heard of several studies that exemplified poor ethical practices, like the Stanford prison experiment with Zimbardo, the Milgram's obedience study, and the Tuskegee syphilis study, which was actually conducted by the US Public Health Service and the Centers for Disease Control. So instead of focusing on everything we've done wrong in the past, I would like to recognize these failures and ethical practices by looking at the changes in how we evaluate and address the ethical integrity of research, research studies, namely through the development of the Belmont Report and the Institu Institutional Review Board at UWF, and also look at you becoming more informed as junior researchers or study participants by the City certif Certificate for Social and Behavioral Research. And then I also want us to critically examine more current studies. So talking about governance for a minute, uh, the development of the Belmont Report goes back to those several studies that were found to have unethical treatment of participants. And I left you different resources in the Canvas uh, page for looking into the different development stages of the Belmont Report and also where it went after that. Like the Belmont was established in 1979, but it was also a major contributor of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services regulation called 45 CFR Part 46, or the Federal Policy for the Protection of Human Subjects, also known as the Common Rule. Um, while this regulation really only applies to federally funded research work, universities typically adopt the same requirements to help guide their IRB committee and their decisions of the IRB committee, even for research that's not directly federally funded. Now the IRB at UWF um, is a committee of subject matter experts from different departments and also has a member from the community that get together and look over any proposals for research. Uh, they review all the educational, training, or research activities involving human subjects at any of the UWF campuses or by any of the faculty, staff, or student as well. And they typically have three levels of uh, review. An exempt review would be one that has just minimal risk or less than minimal risk, actually. It would be like if I was looking at data that was already collected, like if I was looking at data that was collected by the National Center for Education Statistics, and I'm not really even engaging in with people at all. I'm just looking at data, archival data. That would be an exempt type of category. Not greater than minimal risk comes up to expedited level. And there's a different um, qualifiers for what would be within that expedited or fast track approval method. And again, I left you more resources in the Canvas shell to look at both the UWF IRB manual and what those different categories of that fit the expedited uh, level there. And then proposals that are more than minimal risk have to go to the full board. So everyone on the committee has to review uh, research proposals that involve more than minimal risk. Um, going back into our Belmont report um, or our Belmont principles are these three areas of respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. <clears throat> and again, I want you to use the city certification of social and behavioral research course to familiarize with these ethical practices that are expected for IRB approvals and for a deeper understanding of the Belmont Report principles here. But we'll go over them just in short. First, let's check out respect for persons. 
Now, respecting people's right to make an informed decision about if they want to contribute to a study or not is what respect for persons is all about. Now, a lot of this is seen in the informed consent. And that's that first um, like uh, question that you might be asked in a, in a study if you're a participant, asking, letting you know about the nature and the purpose of the study what you're expected to do, like are you expected to come at a certain time and participate in certain um, activities or answer a survey, things like that. The informed consent also needs to be transparent about any risks or benefits associated with the study. And it should also make it clear what the participants' rights are. And a lot of times participants don't know that they have rights while they're in a study they have the right to withdraw, that they can leave that study at any time with no consequence. And they have the right of asking questions for anything they're unsure about. And there's also needs to be special protections for participants who might be unable to fully comprehend the consent process. Like you can't have an informed consent that's written at like a college level if your participants are just finishing fifth grade. It needs to be written at a level that the participant can understand. And if the participant is nonverbal or not literate, then it has to also have special protections in place to make sure the participant understands that they can withdraw or see if they have questions, things like that. The next uh, Belmont principle we're going to discuss is beneficence. And beneficence is looking at the weighing out of the benefits compared to the risks. Are the benefits of answering this question uh, so important and so um, relevant to the questions that we need to answer that it outweighs the potential risks of the, of the study? And keep in mind, there is no study with zero risk. So there's always going to be a risk and we need to weigh out does the benefit of answering this question outweigh the risk in this study. So several types of risk to participants can can be in, in place. Physical risks are kind of obvious, right? If the uh, physical health of the participant is at risk like anything dangerous or hazardous or could have an allergic reaction, things like this, it's kind of easy to write out what those risks might be. But psychological risks can be a little harder to determine. Like some studies could be emotionally upsetting to participants or cause them stress, depending on what the topic of the study is. Um, sometimes participants might be asked to consider either difficult or traumatic experiences, like during an interview, and that might refresh that memory to them and that causes some psychological harm there. Altering participants' moods can also pre present a potential psychological risk. Like if I have a priming where I prime some participants with a happy mood and some with a, down, a downcast mood, then they might be leaving my study with a poor mood that would impact what they do next. So there's all kinds of little ways that our studies might impact the psychological health of a participant, especially when we're looking at psychological phenomenon. And then the final one to consider is the social risk. There's a risk to participants' social standing, depending on the nature of the study. Uh, for example, if I was doing a study on infidelity, and asking um, different partners if they had been unfaithful to their to their partner or spouse, then that if that got out, one that they were even participating in the study, or that they any information they shared with me, that would be a confidentiality breach that could uh, impact their social standing. So and. It's the researcher's responsibility to maintain participants' confidentiality as much as possible. Uh, there's always going to be some potential for 
discovering who is who in a study. And you gotta be really careful about making sure any identifying information is taken out of the data set and not shared with any reports to any like audience or journal or anything like that. The next element or uh, Belmont principle is called justice. And researchers are responsible for ensuring that all participants have a fair chance of receiving the potential beneficial treatments in the research. Like if there was a treatment for a specific uh, mental illness or condition or a treatment group that had a better training than the control group, there has to be a way for the participants to one, have a fair selection to getting those benefits or also being able to have the benefits after the study was over. This is, um, they also need to look at ensuring that potentially harmful conditions are not exclusively administered to one specific group, whereas the benefits are for everyone. And this is what happened with the Tuskegee study, where African American men were with syphilis, where treatment was withheld from them and they were uh, bearing all the burden of that study when the benefits of finding out about the nature of that disease, everyone got to, got to benefit from that information. So again, special considerations need to be in place for groups that might be easily taken advantage of. And this would be like children or um, incarcerated individuals that they think that they might like a coercion thing. Hey, if I participate in this study, maybe I'll get out sooner. And it needs to be an avoidance of putting um, like an incentive in place that puts one group at a disadvantage or makes them feel like they would participate in a study that they wouldn't normally do. Uh, same thing with um, like individuals with illnesses or low income. Uh, because you could say, hey, to participate in this study, you get an extra $20. Well, for some, $20 is like, nah, I'm, I'm fine. That's not going to change how I feel about this study. But for other individuals, $20 is a lot of money. And that would like buy groceries, buy milk, or put them in other harm's way because they would participate in the study out of coercion for the money. So all kinds of things that you have to be careful of there. Again, completing the city program is going to give you a lot more information about these elements or these uh, Belmont principles. So in your city certification uh, assignment, there's a little walkthrough on how to get that done. So moving ahead, uh, looking at more current studies, um, the book brings up a very, very good points about the limitations of avoiding all ethical conflict and still being able to conduct research. Like I said, no research is completely risk free. There's always going to be risk involved at some level, it might be minimal, might be less than minimal, but it still is is there. And sometimes research that is beneficial to one group could be potentially harmful to another group. How do we weigh out that? And then when it comes to deception, sometimes being truthful with participants about what the study is about changes how they behave. And if participants change their behavior, you no longer have a study because they changed their behavior and we don't know if it would have been real without having that knowledge. So what I have for you guys, um, we have to do do. In our concept discussion for module one, we consider a research study in which the researcher posed as a college freshman to gather naturalistic observations of college students' behaviors. So I'm gonna have you read through the context of that, of that study and answer these questions. Was the researcher's method of concealed observation reasonable? Would, what would your reaction have been if you found out that you were one of the students that she observed? And what changes to the study would you recommend to address issues in terms of respect for persons, beneficence, and or justice? 
I'll move over to Canvas and show you that particular assignment. There you go. There's the assignment Life as a Freshman Scenario. And she was asking the question, what are today's undergraduates like? And to answer the question, she took a year off, like did a sabbatical or something, and went as an undercover student as a freshman to college. And she enrolled and spent a year living in the residence hall, taking classes, playing volleyball games. And then in the end, she um, published a book, My Freshman Year, What a Professor Learned by Becoming a Student. And in completing the concealed participant observation, she was able to observe behaviors that students were unlikely to report to researchers, you know, being concerned about what the researcher thought about them or, or any other reasons that a participant might not be as transparent about their behaviors. So again, read through this and you have the questions to consider at the bottom. And I also have a couple of links there for the New York Times web article on, it's just a short piece about the, the study. And then if you wanted to see the book, the My Freshman Year, What a Professor Learned by Becoming a Student, I found that as well and linked it there for you, if you're curious. So that is all I have for you with this highlights video. Um, your deliverables, you want to do your chapter Q&A discussion board, finish your chapter quiz, that discussion about research ethics that I just showed you, and then go check out the city certificate uh, homework. And there's a little video in that to kind of walk you through how to do that as well. Have a great week.